Hey, welcome to the Draft Academy. My name is Mike. In this tutorial, I'm gonna to talk to you guys about ER diagrams. More specifically, I'm just gonna give you guys an introduction to ER diagrams, and we'll talk about how ER diagrams are put together, all the different symbols in the ER diagram, and what they represent. Now, when you're designing a database, one of the most important things is designing a database schema. And a database schema is basically just all the different tables and the different attributes that are gonna be on those tables. So maybe you have some requirements for the different data that needs to get stored inside of your database and the different relationships that that data is going to have. Well, you can use an ER diagram to uh, act as a middleman between database uh, or storage requirements and the actual database schema that's gonna get implemented in the database management system. So an ER diagram is a great way to uh, kind of take, you know, data storage requirements, like, you know, business requirements and sort of convert them into an actual database schema. So we can use the ER diagram to map out the different relationships and the different entities and the different attributes for those entities. Uh, and it can just be a really great way to organize our data into a database schema. So an ER diagram is basically just a little diagram that consists of different shapes and symbols and text. And it all kind of gets combined together to end up defining a uh, you know relationship model. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna show you guys all the different basic parts of a ER diagram and we'll kind of construct our own ER diagram and it'll kind of give you guys an idea of all the different symbols and stuff that we're gonna use. So in this example, I'm gonna be using the example of uh, like a school. So let's say that I'm working for a school and my boss comes to me and he's like, hey Mike, I need you to design a uh, database schema or I need you to design an ER diagram for our database. So maybe this database is gonna store information about different students and then maybe information about like the classes that those students take. So let's start looking at the different parts of the ER diagram. So the first thing I want to talk to you guys about are entities and an entity is just an object that we want to model and store information about. So for our uh, school database, we might want to store information about a particular student. So inside of our ER diagram, we can put an entity, which is just going to be a square just like this. And then we're going to have the name of the entity that we're storing. So it's going to be student. Next, we can define attributes. So attributes are specific pieces of information about an entity. So over here we have our student entity and then we might want to store like the student's name, the student's grade number. So like what grade are they in and then their GPA. So we can store all different types of attributes and we're going to make these little ovals and we're going to connect them to the entity just like that. So the attribute is going to have the name of the attribute inside of an oval connected to our square entity. We can also define a primary key. The primary key is gonna be an attribute that's going to uniquely identify an entry in the database table. So you'll see over here, I actually colored the primary key differently. Now, generally for an ER diagram, you're not gonna be using colors. I just did that so it's kind of easier for us to wrap our minds around. But whenever we're defining a primary key, we're always gonna underline it. So a primary key is just like an, a normal attribute but we're gonna underline it. So here our primary key is a student ID and then I just have the GPA. So, you know, obviously I could put all of those attributes here, um, but I'm just using two for now just to keep it simple. So we have our primary key student ID, which is underlined and we have our GPA and they're both connected to our entity. Next, we can define composite attributes. So these would be attributes that can be broken up into sub attributes. So for example, if we wanted to store the student's name, well, we can store their name, but we can also store their first name and their last name. So name could be broken up further into first name and last name. And so in the case of a composite attribute, you'll notice that we have the main attribute here. It's connected to the entity. And then off of that main attribute, we have two other attributes, F name and L name for first name and last name. We can also define a multi-valued attribute. So if there's any attributes uh, in your data model that could have more than one value, then you can put them in a multi-valued attribute, which looks just like an attribute, except we have an extra circle. So it's just two circles and then inside the name of the attribute. So clubs, for example, like a student might be involved in a bunch of different clubs. And so clubs would be a multi-valued attribute. In other words, it could have more than one value. Like a student's not gonna have more than one GPA. They're not gonna have more than one name. They're not gonna have more than one student ID, but they might have more than one club that they belong to. So next up is a derived attribute. And a derived attribute is an attribute that can be derived from the other attributes that we're keeping track of. So we're not going to actually keep track 
back of the derived attribute, but it's just a way that we can sort of notate attributes that could be derived from the attributes that we're storing. So down here, I have my derived attribute, and you'll notice it's just an oval with these dashed lines. It's called has honors. So has honors is an attribute that we could derive from this GPA. So maybe the school is going to say that anybody with a GPA of 3.5 or above is gonna have honors. Well, we could derive that just from the GPA. So we're not actually going to be keeping track of this attribute, but it's an attribute that we could derive from the GPA that we are keeping track of. So we could just denote it like that. And sometimes it's useful to denote our derived attributes. So we can also have multiple entities. So over here, you'll see I have my student entity, but I can also define another entity, which would be like class. And so a class would be like a particular class that a student is taking, right? So uh, if I was in school, I might take like biology or chemistry, right? That would be what this class is over here. And then you'll see over here, we have our primary uh, key, which is just gonna be class ID. So when we have multiple entities, we're gonna wanna define relationships between those entities. So what I can do is I can define a relationship and a relationship is basically just this diamond over here. And the relationship would basically denote that a student is going to take a class. So a relationship is kind of like a verb, right? It's the student is related to the class in some way, right? So the student is going to take a class and a class can be taken by students. So you can read this both ways. You could say the student takes a class or you could say that the class is taken by a student. And we can also define participation. So you'll notice that the relationship, I'm connecting the two entities using these lines. So the student is connected to the relationship using a single line and the class is connected to the relationship using a double line. So when you're defining relationships, you can define the participation of the particular entities to that relationship. So when I use a double line, this indicates partial participation. What this means is that not all students need to take a class. So when I use the double line, I'm basically saying that only some of the students have to take a class, right? Not all students necessarily have to be taking a class. When I use this double line, it indicates total participation, which means that all of the classes need to be taken by at least a single student, right? So that means that all classes must participate in this takes relationship. So all classes need to have students that are taking them, right? So you couldn't have a class that has no students taking it. All classes have to have uh, students that are taking it. And, you know, maybe that's not what you'd want in your database, but in this case, that's how we could denote something like that. So I could use total participation to denote that all classes need to participate in this relationship. In other words, all classes need to have a student taking the class. So that's basically uh, how we can define relationships and then obviously partial participation and total participation. And so over here, uh, we can also define attributes about a particular relationship. So we have our takes relationship and you'll notice that I'm defining an attribute about this relationship, which is grade. So a student will take a class and the student will get a particular grade for that class, right? So I might take biology and maybe I get like a B plus in biology. Well, that grade isn't necessarily stored on the student entity and it isn't necessarily stored on the class entity. It's stored on the relationship, right? So the only way I can get a grade from a class is if I take it, right? So that's why the relationship attribute is stored on the relationship. And sometimes uh, that'll come in handy. And so we can also define relationship cardinality. And relationship cardinality is the number of instances of an entity from a relationship that can be associated with the relation. Now, I understand that's a very confusing definition, and I think relationship cardinality is something that trips a lot of people up. So I'm gonna try to give you guys a good explanation of it. So over here we have a student, and a student can take a class, but we can define relationship cardinalities on that. And basically what this means is that a student can take any number of classes. So when we say M, that refers to any number. So a student could take basically multiple classes, right? A student could take two or three or four classes. And we could define the same thing for the class. So we could say a class is taken by any number of students, right? So a class could be taken by five or 10 or 30 students. That's basically what that would define. So this would be an NM cardinality uh, relationship. But we can also define other cardinality relationships. So we could say like one-to-one. -one. So in a one-to-one -one cardinality relationship, we would say that a student can take one class 
and a class can be taken by one student. We could also say like a one to N cardinality relationship, which would be a student could take one class and a class could be taken by many students. Or you could reverse it and say a class can be taken by one student, but a student could take uh, any number of classes. And then again, you guys saw NM, which would be uh, a student can take any number of classes and a class can be taken by any number of students. So it's useful to define that relationship cardinality in an ER diagram because that's actually going to relate to how we want to design our database schema when it's eventually time to do that. And also like this is something that could be defined in data modeling requirements. So if the requirements comes to you and says a student can only take one class at a time, well, that's something that you want to be able to represent inside of the ER diagram. So that's kind of how we can uh, represent relationship cardinality. And then finally, the last thing I want to show you guys are uh, weak entity types and identifying relationships. So actually, I think I'm in the way here, but uh, where my head is, it just says class. So you guys kind of saw that before. So a weak entity is an entity that cannot be uniquely identified by its attributes alone. Basically, a weak entity is an entity that's going to rely on or depend on another entity. So over here, I have an example of a weak entity, which would be an exam. So a class can have an exam, right? So an exam is something, it's sort of like an entity, right? You know, a test or whatever that uh, someone might be taking. An exam might have an exam ID, but in this case, an exam can't exist without a class, right? In other words, in order for an exam to exist, it has to be associated with a class. Right, an exam, you're not just gonna like have an exam stored, right? We're only gonna have an exam that's going to be associated with a class. So this is what we would call a weak entity type, right? It's an entity that cannot be uniquely identified by its attributes uh, alone. And we can also define a identifying relationship. And an identifying relationship is a relationship that serves to uniquely identify the weak entity. So an exam can be uniquely identified when it's paired with a class, which I realize my head's in the way of, um, but you guys know what's there. So I could say that a class has an exam and an exam is had by a class. The exam doesn't exist on its own. It only exists in the context of a class. And this is kind of more of an abstract idea. And actually in the next video, we're gonna look more at uh, weak entity types, but this should be at least a little bit of an example and an introduction into weak entity types and identifying relationships, which we're just notating by these double lines. So the exam has a double square and the identifying relationship has a double triangle. And also one more thing to note that whenever we have a weak entity and identifying relationship, the weak entity always has to have total participation in the identifying relationship. In other words, all exams must have a class but not all classes need to have an exam. All right, so that is kind of all of the sort of basic things that you're gonna encounter in an ER diagram. And really everything that you see right here uh, is kind of like all of the stuff that you might see in an ER diagram. And really you can use all of these different symbols in order to represent a you know data model. And what you'll see is we can take this ER diagram and we can actually convert it into a actual database schema. And that's why these are uh, really useful sort of middleman between requirements and the actual database schema. So hopefully that makes sense. In the next video, we're gonna actually walk through an example of constructing our own ER diagram. So that should be kind of cool. And that should kind of give you guys more of an idea of how these work. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like and subscribe to Draft Academy to be the first to know when we release new content. Also, we're always looking to improve, so if you have any constructive criticism or questions or anything, leave a comment below. Finally, if you're enjoying Draft Academy and you want to help us grow, head over to draftacademy.com forward slash contribute and invest in our future.